Oh my god, it's all in my face. I haven't started yet. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you, though. Yeah, no Appreciate you, though. <laughs> yeah, because I know it's kind of broke down. Mm-hmm. What's up, man? Nah, no, it's not just laughing. I feel that. Yeah, I said, I feel like, right, bro. I think I'm going to be able to fix it. I got a kid. Do you want me to keep your phone? Huh? Do you want me to keep your phone? Yeah. Okay, uh, since I'm a mayor, I'm a candidate, uh, Tyrone Mohammed. I mean, uh, Sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I can't walk in um, live at the same time. I didn't even notice it was live. Right, Would you rather have free oh, Wi Fi cool. wherever hey, you go? Hey, 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 so look. So they go on live right here. So it's a lot of people viewing this right now. Y'all want to say hi from North Park? Hey, how y'all doing? This is all North Park students. Say hi. So, like, we really like, gotta watch what we say. Mm -hmm. All those viewers. I was like, come in the front. There's an extra bottle of Pepsi. I'm already knowing. Huh? They need to give Kellen enough to fall asleep, right? Yeah, because he needs calories. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, we, we took this opportunity uh, because you know Yo, I need that recently had in Chicago. Make a stand. You know, we hear from national students all over the place. And the, the recent mass shooting that happened in Chicago brought some realities. And although here as we build the focus of mythology at North Park, we believe that energy follows attention, and we do not spend a whole lot of our energy basically doing ambulance chasing or chasing our own problems. But we'll be remiss if we are in this city, if we are this university, and we turn a blind eye to a lot of what is going on. But our response is not necessarily to go out there and to play the, the blame game, not at all. Our response is to introduce the world, to introduce you, the world's first pathologists that we're training here at North Park University, into an association with different types of ideas, right? Now, um, so what we're doing tonight, we said we'll start at 7.15 to 8.45, and then the, we have um, our class uh, goes, it's, it's supposed to go until uh, 9, uh, it's supposed to go until 9.50, and Joel has his big smile on his face, so I know he's here for the time, uh, prayer the time, right? No, no, no. Well, Noel, well, Noel is gonna be a uh, is gonna be our uh, guy, right? Noel is our point guy since Joel, Joel is, is has has a list, right? He's not interested anymore, right? So uh, we will be here until what, ten o'clock, right? We're trying to get out of here before ten. So we did have a discussion, and in the lineup, of course, you saw from our discussion that it is the the pathology approach to addressing violence problems in Chicago and beyond. What is pisology? I have told you guys uh, uh, that in my work I developed the concept of pisology and I define pisology as the scientific study and application of peace and peacefulness in multiple contexts with the belief that the major solution to violence and trouble is to make peace proper. And profit simply means to be able to deposit something and get more back. That's simply what promise means, right? So if I meet you today, good day, sir, how are you? Good day, ma'am, how are you? I greet you in peace. You may respond to sir, I'm doing fine. And you? 
right? All of a sudden, I pause and say, oh, I like your shirt. And we then, we begin this kind of conversation. So in physiology, profit exists on eight major dimensions. And that's going to be the end, final exam for uh, those of you in all of my classes. Right, it exists in five, in eight major dimensions. One of them is environmental. The other is economic. The third is cultural. So number one, e environmental, economic, cultural, physiological, what physiological means the body. It also refers to the political, the psychological, the social, and the spiritual. So we said environmental, we said economic, we said cultural, physiological, political, psychological, social, and spiritual. These are the eight dimensions of quality of life that we talk about in physiology, right? The idea, the scientific study, the application, the practice of peace and peacefulness in multiple contexts with the belief that a major solution to violence and trouble is to make peace profitable. What is peace? <laughs> peace is not only defined by what it is not. Some think that peace is not violence, that peace is not turmoil. Peace in physiology will define that anything that contributes to a balanced state of mind and existence and to the improvement of quality of life. Anything that contributes to improved quality of life and to a balanced state of existence is considered to be part of peace. And peacefulness is a sustainable reality of peace. So peacefulness is peace over time. And peace simply comes, you can move from a situation of chaos to peace, you can move from a situation of peace to peace, right? But peacefulness is sustainable peace. Why is it important for peaceology to be talking about this issue of peace and peacefulness? What do we mean by that? But before we go further, let me um, thank... By the way, anybody here know, knows Tony Zambwe? A tall, a tall African brother that walks around here. Whenever you see Tony, you know, give him a fist bump and tell him thanks for the sandwich, man. That went down good, right? Tell the sandwich went down good. Right? Tony Zambwe has paid $125, $135 on the tip to give us some sandwiches tonight. Can you give him a round of applause? For that? <laughs> so that's university ministry. That's our, that's our partner. We always have a partner in university ministry. The Criminal Justice Club. Anybody here in the Criminal Justice Club? There we go. Hey, right, representing. <laughs> Who don't go? Ellen. Did I get it right this time? Aline. Aline. Yes, Aline. Yeah. <laughs> right. The, the president of the Criminal Justice Club. Right here. Right. Yeah. So if you're not a member of the Criminal Justice Club, you should join. You don't even have to be a Criminal Justice major. Correct. Right. You just want to be able. You just want to want to have fun, and you want to have fun learning. And you want to have fun becoming the very best you can be. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Can I make a quick announcement? Sure. So, um, for anybody that's interested, we have an FBI agent coming to talk to the Criminal Justice Club uh, to um, Wednesday. Uh, if anybody wants to know how to become a, a FBI agent or anything like that, or has any questions, let me know after this. Where the flyers? Um, it's in Magnuson 310 at 11:45 a.m. on Wednesday. This no. Wednesday. Fires? Flyers. Oh, flyers? No. Words, not the accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no, it's la It's like you're all the way in the front. I'm right here. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry. The flyers. No flyers. No. It was last minute thing. This was last minute with your flyers. <laughs> you know, my public <laughs> officer was not able to get it done before that. You so. gonna fire her or him? No, I'm not gonna fire her. Ah, okay, good, 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 good. good. <laughs> uh, so we're going to pass the word around. Let's try to get some flyers out. Okay, still, we're starting to get the flyers out. So you guys heard it. Come on. Should we give them extra credit or no? Yes. Nah, you guys have enough extra credit. No, more, more. Oh, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Oh, whoa, 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 man. All right, all right. All right. Might as well walk out. Sister Betty's going to have to make an argument. Sister Betty's going to be the jailhouse, I mean, the class lawyer, right? 
You better class lawyer. Yeah. All right. So it's very important. It's very important. We're joking about mm -hmm. this, but whenever you do events, it is very important to recognize those who support you, and it's very important to support those who support you. And and, and university ministries is there always to support us. The criminal justice club. Um, we, that's why we do much of what we do to be able to give this this type of environment, this type of experiences. And the Urban Peace Lab in 307 uh, at Madison Hall is the hub for where we work. Tyro, the name is not on the website yet, but I got to talk to you about it. Okay. Hopefully, we're a community collaborator. Tio Adam is already there. Dr. Bonner and others are there. The idea of the Urban Peace Lab is to give us the opportunity to have this type of activities. And if we're going to do experiments with people, we're going to do experiments to understand how to succeed. Right? If we always experiment how people fail and experiment on things, I heard that why can't we experiment on how people succeed, to help them succeed? Because experiment simply means that you have an a, 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 a intervention group and a control group, right? You, you give some reaction to someone, you don't to another, and then you analyze it. So in the Urban Peace Lab, it is a laboratory for us to try different modes, some business modes, some economic modes, to help us be able to build this, this issue of, of peaceology. So I just wanted to thank this. And the subtitle of, our, of, of, our, of the presentation and the order of matches, basically, I'm going to lay out some ideas of what peaceology is about, and I'm going to give everybody a task. And the first speaker after me is going to be Theo Hadamant that's going to respond to how this relates to his work as an interventionist, right? And Tyrone Mohammed, as a community collaborator, will be talking to us about how this, does this framework of peaceology make sense to move us forward in this issue of violence that plagues our society, right? So two, these two uh, brothers will be talking about that uh, in this process, right? So it's a solution-based public forum here at North Park University, as I've indicated. Now, why peaceology? One of the biggest problems, I believe, we have in our quest to go past the problems of crime and violence in society is really related to the inertia of the nonviolence movement. What I mean by that? What's an inertia? Right? Momentum, right? Inertia is kind of a loss of momentum or a constant momentum. Inertia, is, you know, like a, you know, like a, a, a hamster on a on a treadmill, it keeps going, right? It's in inertia. You know, anything that kind of stays the same or keeps moving like that, it just stays in that kind of a kind of a movement without purpose type of thing. So we see, if we were to study the maps of Chicago in the 1920s, and we study the maps of Chicago now, we will see the same areas that were high crime back then, and the high crime now. We had, a, we had a former superintendent of police come to, to our office and tell to our to to to, to our Tio Adams class and say that in the what is 100 percent, 90 percent or whatever, 100 or 90 percent uh, black and 100 percent of the criminals down there are black. And Lincoln Lincoln Park is whatever percent, 8 percent and 59 percent on the other side are there. You know, people use those numbers. We hear this thing over and over again. And with the quest of violence that we saw in the society, one of the big movements to address issues of violence is to discuss, to develop something called nonviolence. And nonviolence, what is nonviolence? What is violence, by the way? One of you extra credit uh, radiants out there. What is violence? Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. In the, the middle rows. Yeah. <laughs> No, I was right. Is it like to hurt or like damage something or somebody? Yeah, to, yes, that could be yes. That's breaking the rules. Breaking the rules. Well, yeah, I was going to say breaking the rules. Yes, okay. When people don't understand each other. That could be, okay, yes. It's behavior that involves um, physical force. Mm -hmm. Is it limited to physical force though? Mm-mm. What else could be? Could be help me out. <laughs> so we could in a typical way, what I would do with that different definitions of what scholars and practitioners say what violence is. But in general, when we talk about violence, we are talking about action that harms people. And and violence can be mental. If you are thinking that you're gonna punch somebody in the face, 
That's a violent thought. You're going to go to harm someone. If you're thinking of doing harm to someone else, that's a violent thought. If you speak words calling somebody other than their name, you know what you guys say every now and then? And then you forget you're on a Christian campus and you try, hmm. You're supposed to say that. Right? That, those things, right? That's violence. And actions are also violent. Right? You know, financial situations, people are in home, there's a breadwinner, that person's holding money from the other person's making, making money. Because it is intended to do harm to that person, that these are also this, this cross as violent. But typically when we talk about violence, mostly we're talking about physical harm done to someone else. Now, in an effort to move the idea of violence and non-violence forward, or the idea of, of, of trying to address this issue of violence, a lot of you, I'm sure you heard about a gentleman by the name of Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, today, this year, is his 149th birthday, and in his Indian tradition, they developed a term called Ahimsa. A-H-I-M-S-A, -S Ahimsa. Anybody know what Ahimsa is? Ahimsa is an effort to move beyond the idea that violence is physical harm, verbal harm, or somehow psychological harm to someone. And Ahimsa argues that if we touch someone, if we cause hurt to someone else with the intention of unconditional love, that is not violence. So if you spank your child, you guys are from some of you. I've gotten some movements, or well, some of you should still be getting some movements. I'm sure you, I'm sure you did some things in the Thanksgiving break that you deserve a whooping for, but we're not gonna go there, right? We're not gonna, we're not gonna get there. That's what I get, right? <laughs> right, right? So, but you know, the parents spill around and spoil a child. That if we do things that may hurt people, but with intentions to do good, it is not bad. But what is the problem with that? What's the problem with that? That if I hurt you with the intention of doing good for you, that is not valid. What's the problem with that, Matt? Yes, good. You can justify any way by saying that your intention is very good, yes. whether they execute it or not. The bottom of the World Trade Center. It doesn't take into account how the other person feels about the receiving, the only receiving. That, give this brother a round of applause. And Peter, that's for crying so loud, you'll get your turn to get a round of applause, sir. <laughs> so, yes, that is I, exactly what it is. Because I, when I asked recently when I was in India to ask the Ahimsa scholars, well, who gets to say whether or not the action was harmful? And it is the intended person. So if I do something to you and as long as I didn't mean to do you harm, it doesn't matter what you feel. What kind of world is that? Colonialism, slavery, right? Segregation. Huh? We can go down and up and down and down the line. So the idea of violence and nonviolence uh, from the pathology perspective has caused us a lot of problem because first of all, it's kind of a false dichotomy. As a matter of fact, nonviolence has what in it? Has violence in it. In fact, nonviolence is even bigger. Even the non part is even smaller than the violent part, right? And without violence, you don't have nonviolence, right? Because you have to have violence to define what is nonviolence. So, can you imagine creating a world where you're creating something? that you want to destroy based on that thing that you want to destroy? Can you imagine that? It's like having a Kleenex and wiping your nose, but keeping, you know, being a booger in Kleenex, you know, all the time. You just want some leftover filth, right? So in order to have no violence, you gotta keep some violence in it, you know? Can you imagine that? Washing up your refrigerator, but still keeping some of those old vegetables in it? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we need to move beyond this notion of nonviolence. Because if you listen to some people teach nonviolence, they're very violent, don't they? I was in a workshop once, a guy teaching nonviolence, man, and he told the brothers in there, 
I'm your daddy now. Whoa. Oh, I'm your daddy now. Whoa. We don't laugh. He had a little job that was spent, I think, 25 hours. Some little job that none of my students on campus would take. They're like, no, nah, I'd rather work at AR. You know what I mean? Yeah. One of those jobs. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do I mean when I say we need to move beyond this dichotomy of violence and nonviolence? Let me introduce you, this is the very first time that this is coming off the factory, of a typology that I refer to as Zwapam. Anybody wants to know how that term came about? Anybody seen this word before? You say yes, I'm gonna call you a liar. I created this word Zwapam because when I was in India recently and I met the sugar with um, a guru named Shishiram Sankar, I asked him, I said, isn't it paradoxical that we talk about nonviolence to describe something that we want to have the absence of violence? Why carry violence and nonviolence? And he said, well, we use it because of the lack of a better term. You know, sometimes you ask people to do things and you hope that they do it, but after a while you just realize, you know what, you have to do it yourself. So I was, I've been asking for a new term to define to move beyond nonviolence, and without that happening, as strange as it sounds, this is the truth. I was on a plane moving from Shanghai to, Bangal to, uh, to Mumbai, called Bombay in India once, and I wanted to develop this idea. I've been writing about this for a while, looking at the data, and I removed from the alphabet all of the words that had all of the letters of violence in it. The word violence, B I L C, and N O N, I removed that and I was doing a Scrabble game. And I was praying to my African ancestors and to the Lord to give me an inspiration for a word, honestly. So I came up with the word Wapam, the word Wapam just came to mind. And there was an Indian gentleman who was uh, sitting next to me uh, in the plane. And can you imagine I'm sitting on the exit row and I turn to a stranger and I say, sir, do you have a coin? Now that I think about it, you just think, man, this brother is sitting out there on the plane in India asking people for money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he probably didn't notice I was black, and maybe he didn't even care about the story of certain types associated with that. But I had a suit on and stuff, so maybe he didn't do that. So I asked this Indian brother if he had a coin. And he said, yes, I have one, but it's in the overhead bin. So he went into the overhead bin, and he grabbed a coin. And he brought the coin. This is the coin. Brought this coin. And I said to him, he didn't ask me what I was doing with it. He didn't ask me to think I was crazy. He looked at me. He, was, he looked like a professional guy. So he probably mm -hmm. thought I had some kind of logic, right? So what I did, I took the coin and I flipped the coin. And I had, I had Wapam written. And, and I, I had a, the, the word backwards. Wapam. And my power, my power written, and I flipped the coin to determine which was going to be violent. I said, head would be what power, and tail would be my power. And I had the brother serve as witness. I took his business card. I said, if anybody ever disbelieved me, you're going to be my ally. Brother always got to have an ally, right? You, never know. you might need it. So, so, but then I came to the United States, and I contacted my lawyer, and I contacted my internet provider, and I, and I found out that the word WAPAM was already taken. So I asked, I spoke to my African ancestors, I spoke to my Lord again, and I got the wisdom that if I put the word Z in front of it, it is very unlikely. So I placed Z in front of it, and Zwapam, what really Zwapam is, is any action that is intended by the doer or perceived by the receiver as an action that is intended or can diminish the quality of life. So any action, rather, any thought or any word, any, any word, any thought, or any action that is either perceived by the receiver or intended by the doer to diminish the quality of life of someone. Does that make sense? So now, instead of just talking about violence and nonviolence, 
We are talking about whether or not the person who, if somebody who's taking an action intends to do harm to themselves or someone else. So yes, sometimes people intend to do harm. No, sometimes people do, do not intend to do harm. But sometimes people never even really, you know, even really think about it. It's only an afterthought. You know, like if I did something and someone said, what did you, why did you do that? I don't know. And that's the truth. You really didn't know. Sometimes you know, sometimes you didn't know. Now, the person who is receiving the action, is that person perceiving it to be harm? Yes or no? Now, if the, 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 let the numbers represent the highest probability that harm will be experienced or done. So number eight tells us that if you intend to do harm to someone, and the person who, for who you're doing harm perceives your action as harm, there is a higher probability that some harm will be done. Does that make sense? On the other hand, if the person who is doing the action does not intend harm, and the person who is receiving the action does not perceive harm, there's a very low to zero probability that any harm will be done. But here is the interesting thing. Whose intention is more important? Brenner? I'd say the receiver. Do you agree with that or do you disagree with that? Me? Yes. I agree with myself, yeah. Yeah. Some people <laughs> will wonder, someone will say, well, I do not intend to do you harm. But if the receiver perceives that harm is done, there is a high probability that harm will result. Whether the person does harm to themselves or suicide, whether the person does harm to their own as homicide or, or whatever, or whether they go back and forth. Can someone give me an example of that? Of when someone may do something, but they did not intend to do harm, but someone else that it needed to perceive harm and harm resulted. Yes? Um, this happened to me pretty recently where I was trying to get back to somebody because of our personality is different. They regret my actions as being harmful to them. So we, they took to the address and records and everything, but I was only having that. I was trying to do anything that would have been considered bad. So. But they thought it was harmful to them, I guess, in a way. How did they respond? Um, authorities. What? Some kind of authority, basically. Yeah, authority. Well, thanks for sharing. So is that another hand somewhere? Someone else? So the idea is that if you do something to someone, haven't, haven't you ever seen, and, and uh, part of what will happen to Tyrant Muhammad and uh, Tio Alaman, they'll tell us all those examples. When somebody did something, they did not intend to do harm. But can you imagine that? Can you imagine if somebody did something, if you did someone to something to someone, let's say you just pick something, right? Let's just say you decided to pay someone's bill. Let them pay for something good. That somebody had, was in trouble, or you know that they are out of low on money and you decided to pay a bill for them. Or you decide to try to get them a job because you know they're not working. And they perceive that, that you are trying to show off, or you're trying to put them in a bad situation. How do you think you would respond to that? If you did good to someone, or if you did not intend to do some, uh, harm to someone, and someone responded by doing you harm, how are you going to respond? You're going to respond in power. Absolutely, yeah. This is why you're trying to, I'm trying to help people, why you're getting mad at me, and I'm trying to help people. You'll be upset. Not to say, because most of the people I've helped in my career are some of the people that have been turned up. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I've helped a lot of people build their career. I don't take it personally, hold it against nobody anymore, because I believe in forgiveness myself personally. But some people have to get to that point. Yes. Most of the people that you help may be the ones that turn around and step on you sometimes. And that really makes me, not, it happens to me a couple times, it really made me angry. Mm -hmm. You get seriously angry when somebody you help, you know what I mean. 
<laughs> so that is why, so that is the idea, that's why the histology education is right. going, and you guys can expand with that. So the law is clear, but the maybe, right? Because sometimes you know you don't know what somebody's onto. So suppose you come up to me and you don't mean at me in a certain way. I'm just saying just in case people are gonna hit man, because you know you're a big brother, you look like he could get hit man, right? I'm gonna try to snuff you out. You gotta like what you look at. And a lot of there are a lot of bodies that drop in the city because of maybe. Yeah. You know, sometimes, sometimes more than no. Maybe it's the only reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? And sometimes maybe it's more dangerous than no. So now we can continue here, but the logic is as you see. What is the logic of this? That we have to stay out of the rain zone. That if we have to control the poten potential of harm, we have to control the extent to which we perceive other people's actions as potentially harmful. Right? Because if we perceive that other people's actions are not harmful, even when they are intended to be harmful, look at where we are. We just are, we're just on the second level. Because the person did not perceive. And I'm sure as we go through Tio and and and, and Brother Mohammed Tyrone will talk about instances when they probably tried to do something. You ever tried to make somebody mad when they have no shame? Like you tried to get their attention, you know what I mean? You try to piss them off if we just use ungodly language. But they're just not movable. I mean, and you may end up doing something to yourself, you end up being a fool. <laughs> because you make up lies and other things like that, right? So, so you can see that the, the power of peaceology is within the receiver. Because even when people intend to do harm, or even when they are maybe, it is very less, it is less likely to have a result because of the way that we perceive. And of course, we come to the maybe zone that's in the middle. So if we can stay in the green by controlling how we perceive other people's intention, and we can talk we sort of teach some about different techniques that we can use to do that, and we move from a state, in other words, we want them to move from a state of swapa, because that's what it is. That perception, many people you come across whenever they see something else of a negative interpretation of it. You talk about anybody, our oh, beloved Donald Trump. You talk about him, they got something negative to say about Trump. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> On the other hand, there is the typology of my powers. And my powers is a similar idea, but what is the difference? While Zwapam it refers to thoughts, feelings, words intended to diminish the quality of life of another person, right? My powers, on the other hand, are about thoughts, feelings, and words that have good intentions for someone else. So thoughts, feelings, and words that I intend to improve the quality of life of a person. The way I think about you, the way I talk to you, the way I deal with you. And the logic is similar. That if you have good intentions for someone, and the person receives your actions and good intentions, you have the highest probability for quality of life. You come to me with love, I respond to you with love. If you do not, if you in your actions, thoughts, and interactions with someone, that you do not intend them good, and the person does not intend good from your actions, there's a low probability of improved quality of life. It's not going to get necessarily violent or swap harm yet, because remember, we're not talking about intentions for harm. You know, we're just talking about not really good. Because you could be a member. Does that make sense? And then the logic is the same. That if the person who is doing the action means no good, but the person receiving the action perceives it as good, there's a higher probability that good can result. So I will ask you guys, and you'll tell me from being incarcerated, how many times that somebody really did something not knowing that you were going to educate yourself. I hear you, tell, I hear you talk, talk about going to college, or university, to the penitentiary rather than serving time. Somebody's going to lock you up, and they think they're going to isolate you, that they're going to beat you down. But somehow, you found good out of it. And at the same time, somebody could be intended to do you good, but you intend no good out of it, 
Look at how much you've wasted a resource. Somebody offer you a thousand dollars. Somebody offer you a job. But you think there's strings attached. And guess what? You're just a number two. You're way down there because you are believing that there is a, because you are believing that there is a problem associated with this. Uh, and in the rendition, actually, I was supposed to switch green and red because this is supposed to be green and red, but you know, so but we see the high intensity, but it's supposed to be green up here and the red down there, right? Because this is the green is the positive, right? That's supposed to switch. Really and truly, folks, that's all I really have to introduce. Somebody wake up Caesar over there. Don't hit it too hard. Oh, you were thinking, just close me. I'm meditating, right? In this meditation. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, Right. So, so this is really all I have to introduce. I don't want to overload you. And what Tio Hanneman is going to do, what Tyro Hanneman is going to do, is to talk about this in any detail. But before he does that, he comes up. Are there any questions, just based on clarification, on the Zwakam and Mapao's um, typology? No? OK. So we'll go to Tio Hanneman. Tio, if you want to switch to anyone else, you can do this. Or? No, that's good. Yeah, okay. Okay. Is everybody doing okay tonight? Yeah. Oh, all right, brother. How you yeah, feel? I you know, I, I know the professor is dealing with peaceology. Mm. It's definitely a peace in war anytime anyway. We know that much. Uh, what I do nowadays, a lot of times when business come to my house, Tyrone, they say, you sit in the house dark, and it's big old house dark, with no TV on, no lights on. That's my peace of mind. I do that a lot, and it doesn't make nothing wrong with me. Just I've been through all that stuff already, so sometimes I just gravitate towards a peaceful, you know, like surrounding and everything, so I get all my thoughts together. So it helps me stay wholesome from the inside out, in other words. Then I came up with a philosophy, see, it's better not to even have enemies. You know, I had some friends told me years ago, you know, you can attract more bees with honey. I didn't understand what they were saying. Kind of complicated to me, especially coming up on the west side, south side of Chicago. But I know one thing I've learned over the years. It's better for me, I'm talking about for me. It's better to keep your enemies way away from you if you have any. Because if you keep them close to you, you may forget their enemy. Does that make sense to you? Because there's an old school saying where you know, keep your enemies close and all that. My thing is keep them away from, from me. So when I see you turn the corner, I'll do it like that. <laughs> it makes any sense to you. Now, just to bring you up to speed, and I appreciate what the professor's talking about, and I won't mention any names, I'm dealing with a here and now situation right now. And I had to call Tyrone a couple of days ago to get some advice. I have a family member, really like a brother-in-law, that was just recently released from prison, but he's an ex-chief. He's an ex-chief. So when he came home on Thanksgiving holiday, he was all together. Now, he respects me, I respect him, but he has some of the other relatives kind of shaking because he's a very bully and demanding type of guy. So we get a little family meeting going on. I just wouldn't talk about this. That's why I'm not saying any names. But we all in the front room, we about to break bread, and he break out into this here chiefism thing we know that since I've been gone, everybody's been undisciplined. I'm about to discipline everybody. I said, man, what is going on? <laughs> so, you know, me being like the uncle figure, you know, I don't want to front him in front of the, all the family members, right? So I took him in the room by himself with me. And he was trying to explain to me that I didn't understand where he's coming from. And I'm trying to tell him, this is the year of 2018, man. Nobody trying to hear all this stuff. And, you know, so one of my nephews said he was about to go home with his wife. And my, my, my brother-in-law, that's his nephew, you know, about blood. That's his blood nephew. I'm just an in-law, you know. And he told the man, he said, no, nah, you stay with me tonight. You can't go home. And uh, it messed me up. It really did. And even though I didn't even intervene in the situation, it just messed me up. I had to call and reach out and give me some type of advice. Because me being who I am, I'm very outspoken. And I wanted to go there with them. But when the, when the nephew didn't speak up for himself, Tyrone, it made me say, well, this guy, the nephew, like 32 years old, you know, he has a mind himself. So as an end result, I did end up meeting with him. And I'm self in love meeting with everybody. And let them know, these guys are grown men, because you can't be calling those shots on no grown men. But you got to understand, he's been gone for 22 years, and he's still, he's still thinking from a, from a kid where you know, he run things, OK? And I understand mm -hmm. the mindset. I just sent him on a job interview today, the same guy. So he went over to the interview for the job, and the guys told him, he should volunteer, you know, for about you know a week or two, then he might be able to get in. And he told them, thank you very much for the job interview, but I'm not interested. <laughs> he said, I'm not volunteering for nobody. And he went right back to chiefism again, you know. 
Man, man, you're trying to get a guy like me to follow this stop what I do. But I'm trying to help him reintegrate himself you know, into society and be at peace. But it's a work in progress. So I can call some guys, you know, old school guys that used to have status to and have them have a talk with them. Because I'm trying to keep, you know, I'm just going to do the best I can anyway. Keep them cool if I can. Because he's, a, oh, he's older than me, he's an overgrown man. But if he still thinks he wants to live that lifestyle, that's on him. But I'm still going to work with you know, to the best of my ability. The reason I bring this up for you all today is because uh, these type of scenarios play out every day in Chicago. And when the professor talks about the maybe, a lot of people do get hurt because of maybes out here. Because people just don't know. They don't know how to kind of decipher in their minds what's real and what's not real. So it's better to be straight up with people. But, but sometimes when you're straight up with people, you may not be, uh, have no plans to harm that person when you're straight up, but they may take this harm. See, crazy people don't need nothing to go crazy on. If you know what I mean. When a person's already crazy, they got a lot of feelings, ill feelings in them, it only take a second for them to a spark for them to go all the way off. That's why we have to deal with people a certain way and make sure that we, be, we present ourselves as peacemakers. So therefore, when you present yourself as a peacemaker, it doesn't make you a, a, a weaker person. It doesn't just make you a little bit more humble and you can understand. That's like a person that knows judo real good. If you're a specialist in judo, no matter what odds you're up against, you know how to use people's body weight against them. And you've been tried and tried so many times in the art of judo, so if a person runs up on you, you're like a matador. You already know what to do. But if you don't have experience in being a peacemaker, you don't know how to react to certain situations. Like you can defuse situations instead of escalate the situations just on pure experience of making peace. Now, I've done a lot of work in the field of you know, gang mediation, conflict resolution. That's what I do. That comes to me naturally. It comes to me naturally. And I'll just say this one story, then I'm going to turn over to Brother Tyrone. I, I remember this story vividly. I've shared it a few times. Do not try this at home. It's not for the faint of heart, OK? I had a guy on the west side. He grabbed a little guy. He was going to kill him. And uh, this guy, I got the call from the guy's sister. Say, Tio, Tio, you know, you need to come over here in a hurry. You know, they, they grabbed my brother. So they grabbed him, true story, mm -hmm. put him in his back of his corporate building. And I arrived on the scene. I got on a long cashmere coat and a suit because I was just coming from a meeting downtown. And I'm dressed to impress that day. It was cold outside. That's so I cool. arrived on the scene and run to the back. And this guy was sitting on the floor. He never looked at his head. He just had his little hood on her. So I'm clicking this. Wow. He said, Tio, and I know you, you know, you cease fire and you stop the killing, but you better than my business. And I'm going to put you to sleep and you keep better than my business. He told me that. I didn't like the way he said, you know, I'm going to have him up. <laughs> and Tyrone said it again. I'm not going to tell you what he told me, but he said, I'm going to put you to sleep if you keep better than my business. That's why I say don't try this at all. This is about peace. Now, at the same time, he had two pit bull dogs present with him. They were just waiting on his command. And I'm not telling you this story because I'm some tough, tough guy. Now, I'm the kind of guy, as long as I get a fight chance, I'm cool. You're going to know I fought. That's all you need to know. <laughs> this is the thing. Now, the situation was the young guy that he had grabbed was working security for this guy on his drug location. But when the guy got a call from his sister that his mother had an asthma attack, so he ran off the security location to help his mother. But simultaneously, the police raided his drug location. Simultaneously. They thought the young guy had told on them. So he was going to set an example about shooting this guy. So when I arrived on the scene, I, you know, Pride goes before the falls. I, you know, it's winter time. I'm sweating bullets from my forehead because this is a real situation. I just go to say the young guy, and the dogs sniffing me. You know, the dogs are straight up sniffing me, man. You know, the pit bulls they attack. As soon as he gave me the words, I'm watching everything. And don't get me wrong, I wish I could have just walked away, but I was already there. And you know, I'm one of the guys in the image too. I couldn't walk away. So, I, so to make long story short, the guy told me to put me to sleep, and uh, I'm still here today. But what he did, he hit the young guy in his face and knocked him to the ground and told me to take the young guy with me. Now, we can look at that as harm every day of the week. But the moral of the story, he didn't kill the young guy. He gave him to me. You see what I'm saying? And that was amazing. Now, once I took the guy back home with me, two things happened for the young guy. He got out of that game, and that was over with. We got him out of there. Now, I couldn't sleep that night. I'm not going to lie to you, because the guy told me to put me to sleep. So I'm at home tossing and tucking. I said, I got to pay this guy. God is in the blessing, but it's just a good, good story behind this. Um, so, you know, pride goes before the fall. Around two months later, I'm driving through a McDonald's drive through and I know the brother's name, I'm not going to mention his name now, but I, a, a car was blowing their horn at me. It was a guy that told me to put me to sleep and said, how you doing, big brother? And he put his fist up at me, my man. 
He did that because that was his way of apologizing to me without apologizing, if you know what I'm talking about. Now, this is an everyday struggle in the so-called ghetto. That's why I say don't try this at home, it's not for the faith of God. The reality is that we were able to make peace in a hostile situation. I didn't like what he said to me, but my reality was I was going to save the young guy's life. And I had to accept that for what it was. And so I've done this numerous times in my career, but let's just give you an example of being a peacemaker. Because when he told me he put me to sleep, you know, your automatic survival skills kick in. Oh, that's automatic, that's like a threat. Okay, if you're about to be harmed, whatever you want, and he had a, a pistol in his uh, jacket, okay? But I'm watching his hands move, you know, I'm watching his arms and everything, because I know his eyes can't hit me, so I'm ready to, whatever I got to do, right? But I share this story with you all because it's all about peace, because we become more peaceful in our reactions and think before we act. It always works out much better. And uh, how many of us, by a show of hands, wish we would have thought before we said something anyway in some situations? Not all of us, basically, because that's just the way it goes. So hopefully some of these stories will encourage you all to stay on the path of peaceology, because that's what works in life, because I try it every other way. I try the argument way. I try the debate way and all that stuff. Really, it's all cooler heads prevail all the time. Cooler heads prevail each and every day. So with that being said, I'm going to bring up Mr. Tyrone Muhammad. He's going to share his experience with you as well. And then you know, we'll be available for any types of questions if you need any. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, do I need a mic? Can y'all hear me? No, no, we need a mic for the, for the cameras. So the mic. That's why our ears for the camera's ears. Let's put on the on the zipper. We got under here. Yeah, can we color some of that? You got it? Yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. Break the cop. <laughs> huh? This is this is nice. Um, I'm sorry. As it relates to peace, peace out, and this is beautiful, and it's it's like something I'm gonna definitely would like to use as we perfect it on the uh, communities that I serve. And what I mean by that is that the ideas. What a person perceives, the many variables that that entails, and from my experience, is that um, the guys I deal with and interact with, they don't perceive violence. They perceive violence as violence as an equal playing field. That from the, the giver and the receiver, it's like mutual when you deal with gang, drugs, and violence. Your mindset, well, when you're younger, um, depending on the, the uh, severity or the frequency that your mom whooped you for something or act that you do, then that might change turn in the child has. She's never talked to you. She never, she just instantly punished you have y'all seen that before? Mm -hmm. Where a, a, a parent just punishes the child without really explaining to that child what it is that they're displeased with and the actions of that child. I've seen that. The child don't even know that he's, where would he get this guidance from and the tools from if the parent doesn't let him know? So now you see in the child's mind that he's never received any guidance that what he's doing and his actions that he's doing is wrong. So the parent constantly whoops this child. Then in the child mind, it starts to develop a sense, I think, and I've heard, I hate you. <laughs> I've heard children say that to their parents. And, um, and, and, and just bringing it all back to mindset, right? So just take it from the perspective of being in prison. You intend good to me by, or for me, by offering me something that might uh, ease the pain of incarceration. If you say, hey, here's a chocolate bar, here's a snicker, here's a that. In an environment of so-called wolves and so-called deviants, 
that can be perceived as a, a threat. What am I talking about? When you offer a prisoner or something and he don't have a, mm -hmm. uh, a intimate or a personal relationship with you and just by merely being nice and offering him something, that can turn to a confrontation. Why, anybody? Think you might feel like they're looking down on you. That's possible. Anybody else? Anybody, yeah. This, this they, might, they, might, they might think you were booty or something? He might think you offering him something in order to gain something. And in the environment <laughs> of men, <laughs> No, no, y'all don't, don't know about that. Y'all don't believe that? And in the environment again, where we all have our egos and our macho-ism, machismo, we're trying to maintain this front because to have a level of masculinity is power in prison. To maintain your autonomy and, and and like like strength as an individual, that's 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 like that's primary. And if anybody perceives that as weakness, what do you think will happen? Take advantage. Take advantage of it. And that can come in many ways. Let's go to the streets. Um, the other, I'm gonna say, three weeks ago, three week, let's say a month ago. Let's give it a month. And I want to talk about Dr. Peter St. John's mate, right? When you're in the streets and you understand gang culture and street culture in the Chicago, the violence of Chicago, and people often like, man, how you stay there? How you, how you even able to exist there? How you able to move in this neighborhood, that neighborhood? You actually develop a sort of um, a rhythm, a relationship of the block of the street. You develop a relationship with violence. Dang, that's what true. I mean by that. Uh, right here. Oh, okay. yeah, you go. Yeah, you go. You go. No, I was gonna say like, uh, like what you're saying, like, say like I'm the kid on the block that plays sports, and I know all the gang bangs, like, I know all the drug dealers. You feel me? Like that's how relationship like that. Ain't no one, ain't right, ain't got that. Exactly. So. They're like, oh, that's the homie, he's playing football. Right. right. So that's how you build a relationship. So when you go to the you go, oh, I'm good over there. That rhythm, that relationship, they understand that he's not about that life. Yeah. That's not what he's doing. What you um, um, bro, you pretty much just said that it. That rhythm went by. Yeah, you're just a product of what made you, you feel me? You're a product of your environment. You're going to adjust to that environment. You feel yeah. me? You become, I mean, what the, if we're talking about giving and receiving. So the environment gives me certain cues that I suck in. And these cues inform me and it teaches me how to, uh, I would just say, exist in the environment that's, that I have no, or in my mind, I have no power to change. For instance, because I grew up in the environment, although I'm out in the streets stopping violence, stopping uh, a shooting, acting as a conflict resolution specialist, manager, violence de-escalator, whatever term they want to put on it. It's really nothing more than having a spirit in the field for what it is that's necessary and not being afraid because when you're a part of a rhythm or something, if you're dancing, you move to the beat. If you're not a part of it, you can't move to the beat. And instantly, you become a target. People see that it's perceived in some way that you can't even identify. Um, a month ago, some guys tried to carjack me. Now, I'm from the streets, and I'm before the maybes, my maybes heighten my perceptions about how people move. So before, I never, I always, and I'm getting all this key people, Chicago people. I never drive up on the car. I always have a car link. I, this guy here, 
This guy here, he don't think security. <laughs> he will drive up on the bumper. <laughs> and that runs me, that makes me crazy. It, it runs me crazy because in my perception of what violence is in this city and those maybes, I have to look for an exit right. Even if I had to jump the curve left or jump the curve right. Oh, bro. I need space. <laughs> so, so, so it means even when I'm not doing anything, and it's about, it's really about me just, um, yeah. Even if it's just about me just, it's the habit of always being prepared. It's just a habit. It's like y'all have certain things that you all prepare as a college student. You have habits of study. I don't know about y'all habits of study. <laughs> y'all got your study habit? Yeah. It's all right. Uh, it's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Anyway, I see the guys in the back moving a certain way. And I'm wondering what they had going on with this move. It's awkward. And I perceive it through my, I'm always probing my rear view mirror and my side mirrors. And I see them doing certain things. Mm -hmm. So as they are rolled up and approach, I see them move inside the car. And there's four of them in the car. So now we had a light and there's a car behind me. So I'm, 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 and because I know the activity that I'm involved with, I get death threats all the time. I don't say that y'all just hear that y'all heard that for the first time. But what I do, you have to know what I do in Chicago to understand it. You can call on my phone threatening me all the time. I, I just take it as, that's a part of the life. That's a part of being, of doing what I do and trying to, trying to transform and change Chicago that's inherently violent, that's inherently corrupt, that's, when you try to go against that, you're gonna have people who you step on. And they and they they like it's almost like misery love company. Don't mess up my misery because I benefit and profit off of misery. So when you disrupt that, that's what you get. So one guy took it, opened the door, put his feet out the car. A foot out the car, right? And I already know, I already know that move. I've seen it too many times. Oh bro. You know, I've seen it too many times. So as he do it, I noticed the other guy do it on the other side. At right this time, what I do? I jumped the media, hit the spreadway, and when I did that, they jumped in the car and tried to chase me. But I put the horses on, you know what that is. I'm going to horse. <laughs> so I'm just saying to y'all, the perception. What if you're just an average person who don't perceive those movements, right? And y'all have, there's a lot of contacting going on in Chicago. If you don't perceive that movement, you're at a disadvantage. You will see a person doing that and it's not uh, inherently uh, uh, just like, you know, in your face, you don't see that. Because you have to know that life and move a certain way. That's the difference between surviving, surviving violence a lot of times. And so when I tell the women folks in my family, come on, the late don't come in too late, go with somebody. I know you all like to be independent, but sometimes, sometimes, we can know things, know a few more things than you actually do. And you can perceive what I'm doing, doctor, as being violent, when I'm only trying to protect you as my lady, my mother, my sister, my auntie, and telling you to be in at a certain time, or the, the, that's the language, or the action. Or I'm telling you, watch this, do this, move this way. Uh, 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 just, just be clear about your perceptions of things. And man, you, I'm wrong. You, I've heard that so many times. But I'm telling you from experience, if you teach this way, and you show people this way, and you get them that uh, adapt to just just being a more security mind in the country, you'll have less violence in that sense. And then, if you want me to touch any more on the on the prison, uh, doc, uh, we want to leave open, let them uh, 
for what? Yes, what I would like to do is that since we spoke about the issue of just using this one time, I apologize to talk about the yes, babies, the yes and the no's. Let's get some questions from them because we have some people that we're going to dismiss uh, at 845 because we told them that's what we're going to do. And then we have some students that would be extremely disappointed, extremely disappointed if I kept, if I let them out of here anytime before 950. Right, that would be such an atrocity. So then, would it be okay with you? By the way, we talk about leaving and walking in prison. Is that okay with you that you stay with us for? You know, if Tyrone stays with us, we can get out of here before 950. But if he leaves, we have to stay beyond 950. What do you guys want? He can stay. And let's save the day for them, right? So let's talk about, especially those are the guests who are not part of our class, that are probably going to leave in 945. Uh, uh, 8.45, <laughs> sorry. We want to give you the opportunity to ask questions first. Right? And, then, and then we'll talk about living and working with prison and how peaceology and the practice of peaceology could make incarceration journey more pleasant and more productive. Not more, not more present so much, but not more productive. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So let's take some questions on the floor, um, especially from our guests. And I will tell Sarah you asked questions or you didn't ask questions. Uh -oh. All questions are good. Any questions? We have We got one here. I'll do my hands on it. It's not a question, but it goes back to like when you said you watched somebody's body body on the way. I got shot a few months ago. I don't know how that goes. And like now after that, like you feel me when I'm out with my guys or something like you know, I could just read somebody's body body on the just how they move and like you know, going like the way they move and I feel harm. How do you preach forgiveness? I see what? How do you preach forgiveness? Preach forgiveness? So, preach. Know, knowing the hood, you have a lot of relatives that deal with that. Oh, yeah. 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 So, how do you learn to forgive and forget? Well, when you say preach, in, in my sense, in the sense of, of that, I just try to walk. And hopefully by walking and you don't understand in my life, and what I've been through, and I'm able to move beyond the death and the violence that I've seen in my life, whether it be for close from friends or relatives, um, and not retaliate. You, 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 uh, you got to build that tolerance through, through study, prayer, meditation. Because ultimately, study and, and, and guidance, really mentorship and study with a lot of the young guys I deal with that. Uh, we've been battling a lot of little young brothers in the city. Just being able to show them, walk with them, listen to them, move with them, take them out of the environment, and, and let their mind be at peace about what they're dealing with, man. Because if you don't ever remove yourself from that environment, you don't have time to heal or forgive. Because so um, like, it's like a cancer of the mind. So like things, okay. so like things like that be tough. Like, you know, some people that you know just can't can't get out of it. You know what I'm saying? You, you got some kids paying their parents' mortgage, they bills for them and stuff. They own their own stuff. So knowing that, they there's some kids in the on the south side area that ain't still ain't even seen downtown, or even know that Lake Michigan is even the lake. Or even been to the Museum of Science and Industry. That's right. Like, how do you get those focus on those type of kids 
and get them to experience the world that a lot of people don't really get a chance to see. When I tell the young man I did 21 years, what you think you do? Instantly. That's in that life. That's really in that life, but they haven't served no time. What you think they do? Shoot, if they ain't really about it, they should they do. No, I'm saying, even if they're about it. Oh. Uh, then when it was now, yeah. I can do that. I can be doing that too. Nah. Is it? No. Listen. They say, man, what? Because if you say I did 21 years, that implies something that's unspoken. Because if you did 21 years, did operative word, did mean you survived it, mm. and you're standing before me, telling me about what you just did, that's real. That's real, and they stop and they pause, and when you look in their eyes and you see that, that's when you take your opportunity to try to connect the dots because there's nothing new under the sun. The, the, the professor just said that violence been going on. Chicago, the, these young brothers that's in the street, if they understand the history, they're not called gangsters because they created that word. It was gangsters in Chicago that we emulate, long from movies or, or wherever it comes from, that, that was already doing this. And, Y'all heard of the Saints by the time they passed? Yeah. Huh? Well, you did? You did? What is that? Who know about that? Can y'all, uh, 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 a brief description? Mm. My boss. did a big, it was like a hit on the restaurant. Oh, a hit on the ropes. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Al, that's Al Capone there. But he uh, put a hit on seven boxes of the north side again. He called him inside this little business place. They just asked them up. They played like they were the police. But just getting back to forgiveness. Unforgiveness is like a cancer of the mind, a cancer of the brain. A lot of people that do not have the ability to forgive, they live their lives with a lot of resentment, a lot of regrets, and stuff like that. That's why it's very important. See, just because you preach forgiveness, that doesn't make you weak at all. That makes you a stronger person, actually. Because it's hard to forgive, there's no doubt about it. When I'm teaching in the field of criminology here, I'm mm -hmm. sort of justice. The most important person in the restorative justice process is the victim. Yeah. Because a lot of times they don't, we don't focus on the victim. Now over in Rwanda, they had, uh, I think it was like close to 700,000 some plus people killed and murdered. About who two people and the two people. You from Rwanda, all that. Two million. Two million, two million. Yeah, yeah. Two million people were murdered. Now here, this is where the process of healing and reconciliation comes in at. Now they, they're doing their best in that country to reconcile right now. So I don't know how good it's going right now, but that would be hard for me to deal with that. And my family members have been massacred and all that kind of crazy stuff. And I told this story also, Professor, I was in California. The people flew me up there to speak at a conference with a guy from Liberia. And I didn't know what this guy's history was. His name is General Budnick. Now I forget his real name. His, his name, his other name is General Budnick. This African brother, you can look him up, from Liberia. It sounds crazy. It's a crazy story. I didn't know nothing about him when I was speaking at the conference. So they showed a video of what he did in Liberia. He would get naked and with his boots on, a big machete, and he killed 20,000 women and kids, something like that, in Liberia during the Civil War. So now, something to me, just, I lost it for a minute, and I shut down the whole conference. And you know what I mean? I did. I shut down the whole conference. It was the college people there. Everybody there was trying to wait on us to speak, and something snapped at me, right? And I shut down, I mean, literally shut down the conference. And I said I wasn't going to speak with this guy. You know, he spoke with broken English. He was a warrior, African warrior. Now, he probably could if he had a machete to cut me up. <laughs> I could not speak with him. I just couldn't do it. And we shut it down, and some people say they understand because he's a Christian now. And what he was saying is that he redeemed himself. But he was responsible for killing 20,000 women and kids. I couldn't deal with it at that moment, okay? I'm just being honest with you. So the reality is that when you talk about preaching forgiveness, it's very, very important that you go through a process to understand forgiveness. Okay, it's one thing saying, I'm going to forgive, but most people forgive, but they don't forget. Okay? All they don't time. forget. So I just want to share that with you because it takes time to really yeah. forgive. It's not an overnight situation. Okay? Yeah. Any other questions? But I never pre I never preached to those brothers forget. Yeah. I always preach to them brothers. Mm. Do unto others as you will have do unto them do unto you. See, if you start practicing that. I think by extension, you actually are practicing forgiveness. 
Because if I don't want this to happen to me, and when you ask me for real logic, and they were to snatch them off, because I have many young brothers, I go on the point, man, get in this car, fall oh, in. And they, they get in there, because they know I really love them, I'm serious, I've been through this. And then you start to create sensibilities in them, man, that, that, that hard mm -hmm. stuff that, 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 that from the streets and the blocks that, that, that tarnish the heart and even the thought, really the thought, just thoughts are all clouded. You remove that cloud and catch them when they're not on the drove and the pills and the mileage, as they call them, exactly. man, you can, you can really, you can mm -hmm. really penetrate. But it's the removing them from the environment, man. That's what I'm about, trying to remove them out that environment, uh, that violence. So let me ask you guys, I guess I asked both of you guys a question, because central to the idea of peaceology, peaceology moves away from criminology. Right. Criminology is a scientific study and the understanding of crime and criminality in society. Right? Peaceology, I already told you what it is. And the difference between, a major difference between criminology and peaceology is that for criminology as a social problem science, Criminology would ask, why is there so much violence? Why are there so many murders in Chicago? And the usual suspects would be spoken about. Yeah. But in pathology, the question is to ask, why do problems exist? But the main question for pathology mm -hmm. is, why aren't the problems in the worst? Exactly. So I ask you from your experience on the streets before you become incarcerated, your experience coming out now as a change maker in the community, and Tio asked me the same question. Why isn't there even more violence in Chicago? Because you have those core groups that, not, that, that don't necessarily get attention. There are branches and fruits of peace within these organizations. Now you hear, the big, you hear about the big organization that's actually been funded to do that. But when you look at people like Violence and the Rough with the Interrupted, the T.O., and just those little um, relationships that we develop with different groups and segments of the communities, that's why it's not worse. Because guys like myself come out, and I'm always trying to teach one. And there's other brothers that do the same. They, they, all, they all deny, like uh, Earl, my man Earl got one called Guts, Give Up the Streets. He actually challenged these young brothers and give them a t-shirt as well on live. What would it take for you to give up the streets? Why are you in the streets? He challenged them on the spot. And they'll tell you what they want. And we don't listen to them enough. And there's, there, there's not more violence, man, because of guys like this here, T.O. and so, other brothers. So do you believe then, in what we talk about in mythology, that the solution is not to try to beat the dead horse to say, why did this brother join the gang? Exactly. Why did this brother do this and why did his sister do this? Exactly. But to say that yeah, in spite of why those may do this, why aren't things worse? And do you believe that the solution is really, I, mean, I, I see it as a 20, mm -hmm. 20 80 from you. Yeah. We need to put 20% of our energy towards understanding the wow. problem right. and 80% towards the solution. And I believe, because I believe we cannot ignore the problem that could exist. But if that's all what we focus on, violence is very addictive, right? It's very seductive. It's, it's sexy, right? It drives us. You know what I mean? You, you want to, that's what takes you to the movie. You know, you want to see how violence, to some degree. Too far, like Pope Fulcher, will maybe get a little bit crazy. But you want a little confident, right? You want, you want some action. That's right. So, so do you believe that part of what we need to be doing is to study why Study like, for example, we talk about recidivism. Not about recidivism, but recidivism. The we talk about the revenge. Revenge without violence. What do you guys think about those, those things? Well, you know, I just truly believe that we, we need to come up with a new model of peace policy that, that new model. I believe that young people from all walks of life are going to learn more about peace policy and peace techniques from the age of first grade <coughs> up. And then also the education community at large as well. See, it's one thing educating the young people in the schools, but you have to take outside the schools, the classrooms, educate the community, and everybody grew up in a peace out type of mindset. So still, then I believe we can make some changes then. 
Because we know the problem. We know the problem is the same every year. Like right now in Chicago, you have over 480 killings, uh, over 2,000 shootings, and every year, that's the problem. We know that everybody talks about, you know, like gang violence, they talk about gun control and all that kind of stuff, but that's every year. But if we really start, if we're sincere about leaders, community leaders, educators, we uh, push peace out of the schools at an early age. So young men and women will learn how to deal with what's going on with their impulsive behavior, you know, like impromptu, you know, peer pressure. They need to learn how to deal with this stuff at an early age, and most important, at the home as well. You got to invite the mothers and fathers to get involved in the peace allergy sessions. Like you have peacemaking circles, you need good peace allergy sessions to educate people about peace. We got to flip the narrative. We really do, because right now they say criminal justice. It's all about what criminal justice is doing. Right. Right. This is new, and when you introduce a new idea, it's the hardest thing in the world to push all the time. But you got to push it from the ground level up. And that's my response to that. So you obviously got to highlight those crimes that we stop from becoming murders. Oh, See, if you keep focusing on the few murders and never the ones that we actually prevent through conflict resolution and peace out yeah. from becoming murders, then you're going to continue to, uh, that would be the 80%. So now, part of the language that we use, like on campus, we'll say, you know, we know a lot about what happens when something happens. Mm -hmm. But we know very little about what happens when nothing happens. Right. Every day. <laughs> That's the key talk. So, we cannot get out of here before one of Sarah's students, before one of the guests. You guys got to ask a question. That's how we get down in criminology. So for you guys to get out, you'll take it out of here. You got to ask a question. If you don't mind, I'm just going to say this. Sister from Rwanda, if you don't mind me asking. Like, how, do you, how do you feel about the peace process in uh, Rwanda now? Do you think it's working, actually? Um, it's actually a Right. It's been a long time. Yeah, yeah it's, um, they've worked on bringing both the tribes and right. together. And it's, it's really a great thing because as you, if you're in Africa and different countries, you'll notice that they use Rwanda as an example of right. working on their like, peace movements or whatever it's called. But yeah, it has been work. And I'm, I'm actually proud to do it. That's what I'm from. Right. Who did the peace? Mission over there. Pete from the Hutu. So, so um, that would be the president. Okay. Because he was the one from the Hutu side. Yeah. He led the peace process. That was a remarkable because Tutsi people, but correct me if I'm wrong, they were the ones that thought saw a lot. Yeah. Right. Because we have the Hutu. Yeah, the Hutu was the majority there. Yeah. yeah. So, so Mugabe, did he change his ways or has he always been like this? Why did he change? or? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I mean, who's, what's, I'm the, what's the name of the, huh? Agami. Agami, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, he didn't change. Right. That's how he's been. It's, yeah, it's always, um, okay. when he was, he came from Uganda, because that's where he was from, mm -hmm. to, and then, um, they, from outside Uganda, they were in Burundi, um, Uganda, Tanzania, yeah. and they formed safe to say then that the Belgian people or the French people to some degree helped, you know, that war kick off between the two tribes when they, they pulled out. They, they, they kind of started doing the colonialism. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm talking about. I've studied something. Well, we invited you. I would like to try to keep our words that we said. We were going to take a, we will end at 8.45 for those of you who are our guests. So, uh, for, so thank you so much. Unless you have a burning question that's on your heart, like an indigestion. If you don't have, if you don't ask it, it's gonna hurt. We'll give you one chance to get it out. No? If not, oh, before you leave, I need a favor from everybody. I need a favor from everybody. This could take you less than a minute. I need you to, to donate a sheet of paper. Do not put your name on it. And I need you to write anything you truly believe with the experience that you have with this discussion of this hour. Was it worth your time or not? Did you learn something in the process? Any good words? 
that you have for our guests is important because Mr. Mohammed, as a returning citizen, because you have been, as an adjunct professor here for me, you always want to believe that what people have value to you. So please write something. Some of you did not get a chance to ask a question. Colin, I know you had a question, but you didn't get to ask me if you could ask me in your papers, huh? Did you have a question? There we go. So spend some time. Do not rush yourself. And uh, if you want to have a sandwich on the way out, um, those of you who can guess do that. For those of you who are returning with us, after you write your statement, don't just write two words, write, write something substantive. Uh, give it to us, and then you can take a five minutes break, and then you come back in so we can try to get out of here uh, before 9.51. I can't go anywhere. <laughs> Not talking to I'm you sorry. anymore. Man. <laughs> yeah, look at the rest of the nope. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's a petty story. <laughs> oh my god, I feel like it's petty. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're funny, huh? Yeah. I'm gonna stop it now. 